Why is this? Because we now don't have to pay for the machinery or the harvest costs to get that forage. We can actually make the cow go out there and do her own work to get her own diet instead of us having to feed her. So I like to start off with this quote. Um, it's one of my favorites um, to kind of talk about like integrated production and things like that. The beef cow is a harvester of forage. So when we think about cattle being ruminants, um, they have a really good opportunity to be able to take some of these really low quality feeds and things like that. Um, like Warren was talking about some of that like straw and corn residue, stuff that's really low quality. We're not gonna use it for anything else. And they can turn it into a really high quality nutrient product in the form of beef. Um, so I think it's our job as producers, educators and consultants in the industry um, to do what we can to kind of capitalize on this. Um, you know, what can we do to um, feed more of those byproducts, feed more of those things that we're not gonna use for other um, production and things like that. So kind of being innovative um, when you're dealing with production. So this idea about making the cow do the work, um, kind of think about grazing management, it's all about balancing what the cow needs and what you have available for forage. So we know that cow nutrient requirements are gonna change throughout the year. We also know that our forage availability and quality is also changing throughout the year. So it's kind of a constant balance of um, adding those two things up. So this is kind of complicated. I'm sure a lot of you guys have kind of seen this or thought about it before, but this is just a graph showing how nutrient requirements of a cow changes throughout the year. Um, so it goes up very high after calving during peak lactation, um, which is about six weeks after calving. Um, that's when she's milking. That's when she's gonna have her highest nutrient requirements. And then you can see this really steep drop off later in the year. That's at weaning time when we've cut off that lactation. Um, so her nutrient requirements are gonna be the very lowest um, after you wean that calf. So for spring calving cows, that's gonna be fall, um, kind of when the, the grass is going dormant and when people start harvesting and things like that. So um, if you kind of think about opportunities that are low quality feeds that you can kind of fit into her low nutrient requirements, such as corn residue and things like that. Um, and then this is just kind of a typical graph, graph of some pasture grasses. Um, this is kind of their life cycle and their quality is gonna be um, when they're growing. So if you think uh, kind of in the springtime, our pastures um, and forages are gonna be going up in their production and their quality. Um, and that kind of coincides when we have cattle at their peak nutrient requirements um, when they're lactating. And that kind of drops off as it, as it goes dormant. So kind of the rule of thumb with grazing forages is that the, the more mature the forage is, the lower the quality is. Um, so if you kind of think about color, um, as that grass turns brown, it's gonna be lower in quality. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of briefly go over some of these type of strategies. I'm gonna talk about both grazing cropland and grazing grassland, um, because I think these are just, um, especially in this area of the world, we kind of have limited access to pasture. I mean, a lot of our pastures are more um, fragmented, farther apart, maybe not such big pieces in one um, area. And then, um, yeah, to kind of just get you guys thinking about some potential strategies that you could employ. So moving into grazing cropland, um, just show of hands in here, is there a lot of people who do graze cropland or are involved in that? Awesome. Um, so I kind of just want to talk about some of the economics. Um, this was a survey done in 2019 um, where they kind of looked at from the crop sector and the livestock sector, how valuable grazing uh, residue was to those industries. Um, and I just pulled North Dakota and South Dakota out of that because that's where we are. Um, but if you look at the top of the graph in our crop sector, um, only about 20% of the corn residue that we produce in these states is actually grazed. Um, and when you combine that with our rental rates in both the states, um, it contributes a lot of value to the crop industry in terms of rental rates. Um, almost 3 million in North Dakota, 
and almost 13 million in South Dakota. And then when you look at the livestock sector, um, again, we have about 20% of the cows in these states are actually grazing crop residue. When you add a rental rate to that, um, we come to about $6 million worth of feed value to North Dakota and $17 million of feed value to South Dakota. So this is kind of just demonstrating that grazing crop residue is really valuable for both sides of the equation. We get rental rates on the crop side and we get cheap feed for the livestock side. Um, and I know um, that 20% is kind of low. And I just want to say that I do know um, that some of the problems is cows are not always close to the cropland. Um, as well as in the Dakotas, we typically have a shorter time frame between when those crops are harvested um, and when the when the snowpack comes in. So with some snow, cattle can still easily graze residue, um, but it's more when you get that hard pack or any ice or things like that, they're pretty much done. Um, but some other reasons um, that people don't graze cropland, 20% um, of people thought in this survey, thought that grazing would decrease subsequent yield. Um, so for example, in a corn soybean rotation, if you're grazing corn residue, a lot of people think that their soybean yields could be decreased. And along with that, they kind of think that it that could cause some issues with soil compaction. Um, they think it can interfere with their farming practices. So maybe they have cattle on there when they want to be in the fields working it or things like that. Um, and some other genuine concerns is cropland typically lacks livestock water sources and fencing and facilities. So that's kind of like added labor for the cattle producer. But I want to address um, kind of these two common reasons. So soil compaction and farming practices. Um, University of Nebraska put together a study um, to kind of talk about um, this, this soil compaction concern. Um, and kind of get an answer once and for all how it really affects soil compaction. So what they did, um, this may be kind of hard for you guys to see, um, but essentially what they tried to do was create the worst case scenario for grazing. How bad can we graze a field and see how badly it affects soil compaction and things like that? So what they did um, on this cornfield, they had areas that they left completely ungrazed um, they had some that were grazed at what we would consider normal. Um, and then we had like our triple extreme situation. Um, we waited until the spring actually, and then waited until it rained and the field got muddy. Then we kicked cattle out on the field at extremely high stocking density just to see what would happen. And for the record, I'm not recommending this extreme grazing, um, but we just wanted to see what would happen to the soil. So um, you can see at the bottom, about 90% cover on the ungrazed, 30% cover on the normal, and only about 20% cover was left on the high graze field. So I hope you guys can just visually see the drastic change in these pictures. Looking at the um, effects on soil, um, penetration resistance, that's like how hard it is to like push into the soil um, and bulk density, um, that's kind of like how much um, space is in the in the kind of like the soil structure. Um, so we have our non grays in yellow and our really high grays in blue. So you can see that it definitely did increase penetration resistance and bulk density um, by including grazing. But what I want to point out at the top of this graph, we have this red line um, and that is what we would consider our negative effects threshold. So as long as we're below that, we are not expected to cause problems to plant growth. Um, if you get above that, then there can be concerns about the roots being able to push through the soil and things like that. Um, but even in our really high extreme grazing, it's well below the threshold. So not saying it didn't increase soil compaction, but it's definitely well below where we would consider negative effects. Um, and now looking at surface roughness, I think you guys can tell us from the picture too um, that the trampoline and cattle walking, it definitely did increase the surface roughness um, pretty drastically. They actually had to slow down planting and increase down pressure um, when they planted their soybeans. Um, but then we actually saw an increase in soybean yield. 
um, by four bushels per acre from the non-graze to the extreme grazing situation. And you might be sitting thinking, well, four bushels an acre, whatever. Um, but at today's soybean prices, say like $12 a bushel, um, that's an added like $50 an acre in increased yield. So I'm not saying um, that that's a good strategy, but it is something to think about. Um, so kind of take home messages from that. Um, soil compaction was well below negative thresholds. Um, they did have to slow down their planting, um, but that was kind of offset by an increase in soybean yield. And the thought there is that cattle are pushing more of that plant material into the ground. Um, so they're actually increasing um, soil organic matter um, and feeding the soil microbes, which then is increasing nutrient cycling, which increases nutrient availability for that soybean plant in the next year. And again, the extreme grazing is not recommended, but we can, what we can conclude from this study is that normal grazing is totally okay for soil. And any of those negative effects we saw were back to normal after the soybean plant was harvested. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about grazing corn residue. Um, I'm assuming a lot of you guys do graze corn residue or are at least familiar with it. Um, we know it's an economical winter feed source. We know it can help extend the grazing season, um, which means we're making the cow go out and do the grazing. We're not feeding her harvested hay. Um, and we know that both crop and livestock producers benefit from cheap feed and from rental rates. There are some problems with grazing corn residue. Um, each of the plant parts is different in quality and quantity. Um, the main thing that cattle are gonna eat is the husk and the leaf. They're not gonna eat the stock, they're not gonna eat the cob. And in today's world, we don't really have that much minimal grain left. Um, so that's really not a big diet component. They might eat a little bit of it, but primarily it's about husk and leaf. Those are the greatest in energy and crude protein. The problem, is that corn residue is also susceptible to weather. So how many of you guys in the Dakotas have driven by a fence line and seen all the, the, the corn leaves and the husk blown into it? That is unfortunately not in the field anymore, which means the cattle don't have access to those nutrients. We also know that snow cover, especially ice pack, can actually physically prevent the cattle from grazing corn residue. And we also know that precipitation can be a problem. So if you're um, grazing in muddy conditions, um, that can kind of affect the soil as we saw in that last study. Um, and mud is a whole different conversation um, in terms of calf health and performance and things like that. So things to think about. The other problem with grazing corn residue is that our cow nutrient requirements are typically increasing throughout the grazing season, but our nutrient availability in those fields is decreasing as weather loss and things like that occur. So again, if you think back to that um, graph of the cow nutrient requirements, they're gonna be increasing as she advances in gestation. Talk about spring cows here. Um, so you may have to start supplementing and things like that later in the season as she gets closer to calving. So some of my recommendations um, is to begin grazing shortly after harvest because we have a shorter window in the Dakotas before the snow comes. Even if the ground's not frozen, I say get out there and graze those nutrients while you have access to it. And wall cow nutrient requirements are really low um, because mature cows can actually easily gain condition on corn residue, um, especially after you cut off that lactation. Younger cows can kind of struggle on corn residue because they're still growing. So they have higher nutrient requirements. Um, so I say with young cows, maybe it's a good idea to move them to fresh cornfields faster um, so that they can get more of that high quality husk and leaf out of the field. And again, husk and leaf are what they're gonna eat. Um, so pay attention to availability of husk on the field. If there's a low amount of husk on the field, that is low diet quality for those cows. Um, so now moving into talk about cover crops. Um, Sure, you guys have all heard the spiels about cover crops and soil health. Um, I'm not here to fight that battle, um, but we, knew, we do know that it benefits soil health, okay? I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and we also know um, that cover crops can actually grow when our pastures are dormant. Um, so that gives us an opportunity to have higher quality grazing for those cattle um, when our pastures and other things are actually dormant. 
And we also know that some cover crops um, can, can give us more options. Um, so maybe we have a chance to graze them um, and then we actually can mechanically harvest them later for silage or hay or things like that. That's gonna increase some of your stored forages um, and potential income. So um, just kind of want to highlight some of the good for soil things about co uh, cover crops. Um, the first principle of soil health is soil cover. Um, so we want to keep that soil covered um, with plant residue. That's going to reduce erosion. And then that plant material is actually going to help capture some of that moisture, um, which is going to help um, increase soil moisture, which helps with our spring green up and later crops and things like that. So um, the other thing is you don't want to graze, if you're grazing corn residue, you don't want to graze too much that you have a lot of bare ground um, because that can actually have the opposite effect on the cover. Uh, the second principle of soil health is limited disturbance. Um, so I'm not going to fight the no-till battle or the till battle here, um, but it is a good thing to minimize physical and chemical disturbance on your soil um, because we want to maintain that structure um, and maintain the microbial biology in the soil. So um, the great thing about cover crops is they can actually be drilled into existing crops or flown over, things like that. There's a lot of options. The third principle is keeping a living root in the soil for as long as possible. Um, the root is actually gonna be feeding the, the soil microbes and things like that. Um, and it actually increases water filtration. So the roots actually act like almost like little slides for the water to go down into the soil. That's what we want, okay? And then the other great thing is that living plants offer much higher nutrition to cattle um, rather than dormant ones. So I don't know if you guys can really see this picture. Um, this was at an agronomy conference this summer. Um, this kind of just showing the, the length of the roots um, in multiple cover crops. This one over here on the left um, it's actually Sudan grass. You can see how um, pretty crazy those roots are. Um, then we have oats, turnips, peas. Um, I can't read that. Sunflower and buckwheat or something like that. So, um, But really, this is just trying to show off the root structures. So the fourth principle is diversity. You can kind of interpret this how you want. Um, but in general, the more diverse your ecosystem is, the more resilient it is. So if you think about a cover crop with multiple species, maybe some are more drought tolerant, some can grow more with less rain, things like that. Um, that way, if you have variable growing conditions, maybe um, you still have some of those species in your cover crop that are gonna come up and, and be useful. Um, and then I always have to plug the multi-species grazing. <laughs> um, a lot of people have been having a lot of success with um, grazing small ruminants um, or chickens or pigs, things like that, um, in addition to their main paddle crop. And then the other, the fifth principle of soil health is integrating livestock. So um, not only does grazing um, living plants give a higher plant of nutrition to cattle, um, but cattle are gonna help increase that microbial activity and nutrient cycling on those fields um, through their waste um, and trampoline. Um, so integrating livestock is a really good thing for cropland. In general, cover crop options are endless. You, so you can kind of think about what works best for you. And don't be afraid to start small. You know, if, if there's like an 80 that's planted to something, you want to experiment and see how it goes. Um, don't, don't be afraid to just kind of dip your toes in and see how it goes. The other thing is assess the, ca assess the cash crop situa situation. Um, so if you're in a corn soybean rotation, that crop's only growing for half the year. Um, so think about ways to um, keep a living root opposite of your cash, cash crop. Um, and then assess your cow nutrient requirements. So think about when you're feeding a lot of those harvested forages. Are there opportunities, you know, even a couple weeks or a month um, that you could replace harvested, store harvested forage? Um, with a cover crop or something like that to make your cattle do the work to graze. Um, and then specifically within cover crops, annual forages are a pretty good option um, because you have the opportunity to graze them plus hay them and sile them, um, terminate them for a cash crop or stockpile it, which means let it go dormant um, and you can actually graze it in the winter also. Um, 
So with annual forages, you, you kind of have um, some options. You can plant them after cash crops. Um, you can graze them in the spring before your pastures really green up. You can graze them in the fall. Um, there's a lot of different pathways. Kind of talked about this already. Um, yeah, you can chop them for silage after you graze them. You can cut them for hay. Um, you can stockpile them. This is kind of what I'm talking about. Um, there's been a lot of producers that had success with just letting it mature in their field. And again, that kind of depends on the cash crop situation. Um, but annual foragers can hold up pretty well in the snow in the winter. Um, and people have had a lot of success with grazing an annual forage, like Sudan grass or something like that, um, just letting it mature and grazing it in the winter. Um, so again, many options exist. Um, so think about things that will work best for you. Um, and again, we talked about this plant maturity concept. So as the plant matures, its quality is going to decline, um, but its tonnage is going to increase. So think about what you need um, for to be able to meet your cattle nutrition requirements. Um, and that's going to tell you when you should graze it or when you should harvest it. The other thing about annual forages um, is tetany and nitrate toxicity. Um, I'm sure you guys have all heard that before. Um, so potentially um, you should be testing for nitrate analysis in annual forages, especially in drought situations that can make it worse. Um, but feeding a high magnesium supplement to those cattle and waiting until the forage is at least six inches tall, those are going to help combat some of those issues. Um, so moving away from cropland, we're going to talk about some grassland um, ideas here. Um, and I know um, that a lot of grassland around here is kind of fragmented in, in pieces. Um, these are some options that can be really successful even on a small scale. Um, so just kind of think about how these options could fit in with what you're doing. Um, one of the first things I like to bring up is targeted species grazing. Um, so cool season grasses are the first ones to kind of green up in the spring. Um, but invasive cool season grasses, um, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, um, they're actually not as good for us. They're not as nutrient dense. Um, they're not going to give you as much tonnage. And they actually decrease your adaptability on these fragmented grasslands. So um, if we can target graze some of those cool season grasses while they're green, while they're good, um, before they kind of mature and lose their nutrients, um, that can help make way for more desirable species and also help um, give us a boost um, in our cattle diet. So again, I want to show this graph. Um, I'm on the range side, so this is like second nature to me. For, but for those of you who haven't seen this graph before, um, this blue line kind of depicts the cool season grasses and how their growth curve goes. Um, so cool season grasses like cool temperatures and moisture. Um, so they're the first things to green up, start growing in the spring, but then they're going to drop off and kind of mature when it gets hot in the middle of summer. Um, and then they might have a bump again in the fall. You know, we see some of those cooler temps and rainfall in the fall um, that can kind of green up those cool season grasses again. And then this yellow line is our warm season grasses. Um, so they like more of the hotter temperatures. Um, so they're going to start start growing kind of like midsummer. Usually in this area, kind of like July 1 is a good time that like we really see those cool seasons start to mature. We start to see a lot of growth from warm seasons. But this is going to change depending on weather conditions every year. So. Um, so what do I mean by an invasive cool season grass? Things like smooth brown grass, Kentucky bluegrass, crested wheatgrass, and sheetgrass, those are all invasive annual grasses um, that are not, not as good um, in terms of tonnage and quality when we compare them to our native grasses. So um, basically, this is a picture of cheat grass. Um, and you can see how it's like kind of green and lush, like cattle will, cattle will eat that. And it's high quality while it's green. The problem is, is that it turns brown and matures so quickly. Um, and when it turns, it's going to be really low quality. Cattle aren't going to eat it, especially after it seeds out. They don't want that. I, I wouldn't want to eat that either. But that's kind of this concept that as the grasses mature, their quality really drops off. So 
Um, native grasses um, actually help maintain new, a higher nutrient value for much longer. Even after they go dormant, they do decline in quality, but they're gonna have a much higher quality than those invasive grasses. Um, so some of our native cool season grasses, these ones are also gonna green up first in the spring, um, but Western wheatgrass is really great. Um, needle grass and prairie june grass. Um, and then some of our native warm season grasses that are really great, Indian grass, switchgrass, prairie sand reed, and big and little blue stems. So basically what I'm trying to say, if we can target species, graze some of these invasive grasses while they're green, we can kind of go in and hit them hard in the spring, it's going to knock them back and let some of these native species come up, especially our warm seasons. And what's the benefit of doing that? These are much higher quality. They hang on to their quality longer, um, and they're more beneficial as a dormant grass, especially in hay and things like that. If you hay any of your grassland, um, these are the desirable species. Not that the invasives don't have a benefit because they do while they're green. This whole concept is that once they mature, they're kind of done for. So I kind of wanted to demonstrate the difference in um, tonnage also. We know that our invasive species are only going to give us about 100 pounds per acre per inch of leaf growth. Versus our natives are going to give us closer to 150 to 200 in our cool seasons and almost up to 250 in our native warm seasons. So what does that mean? You get more grazing out of those species, as well as them being higher quality. Um, so again, um, if we can graze our invasive, our invasive species while they're, while they're green and they're growing, um, that's going to give a, give a lot more room for our um, native species to come in, especially our warm seasons. Um, so, so the idea is graze your cool seasons while they're growing and then get off of your pasture if you can to let some of those natives come in. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some rotational grazing. Who's heard of rotational grazing? What do you think of when you hear rotational grazing? Polywire, moving cattle twice a day, stuff like that, yeah? That is the extreme scenario, okay? You guys can do rotational grazing. You do not have to be that intense, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you some easy ways. It's all about managing um, the recovery times and the grazing times in that pasture. So um, what is recovery time? That's when you're not grazing it. That's when the grass can um, come back and grow again and get bigger. Um, so if you think about certain species will have different different growth curves, right? So our invasive cool seasons, they're gonna grow a lot early in the season um, and then they're really gonna drop off. So um, if you're grazing them really hard while they're actively growing, you're gonna prevent them from getting into their reproductive phase and things like that, okay? Um, and then depending on how you rotate, your grazing intensity, you know, if, if you're, you can potentially graze a pasture multiple times in a season if you don't hit it too hard and you let enough recovery come back. Um, and the other thing is that while you're grazing, you're preventing those grasses from maturing because you keep damaging the plant. So it has to fix itself before it can mature, right? Um, but we also know that as grasses mature, they decline in quality. So if we can graze those grasses enough that we're not beating them up, but we're preventing them from entering the seed stage or their reproductive stage, they're gonna maintain a higher quality for longer because they keep putting out that leaf material instead of the seed material. And that leaf is what we wanna graze. That's the high quality part. So some really, really simple options. Deferred rotational grazing. That's kind of what we talked about with this targeted season grazing. So if you can not graze your pastures while it's warm season time, and maximize your grazing while it's cool season time and hit those invasives, that's a really good option to um, increase those desirable species in your pasture. And then you can hit those pastures potentially multiple times when those cool seasons are coming up. Another option is rest rotation grazing. 
this one is super easy. I think if you have the pastures to do it, this is so, this is like the least amount of work. All you're going to do is let one or more go completely ungrazed for the whole, whole growing season. And you're probably thinking, how am I going to do that? Like I need the, I need the grass to, to feed my cattle. Right. Um, it doesn't mean you're not going to graze when it's dormant, but if you can just stay off a pasture or at least a certain area in the pasture during the growing season to let those species fully um, go through their life stage and put down as many roots as they can, um, then you can go back in in the winter and graze it when it's dormant. Yes, it's going to be lower quality, um, but it's a good option for winter grazing and you can still get use out of that pasture and you don't damage it as much when it's dormant. Okay. And then the other thing I just had to throw up there is that intensive rotational grazing that I talked about at the beginning, um, really fast and intense grazing to keep grasses in their vegetative stage. You can graze paddocks multiple times, um, but it's going to be a big investment for fencing and labor. So kind of things you have to think about. Um, so again, grazing management on cropland and grassland, it's all about protecting your pasture health and meeting your nutrient requirements for your cattle. They're like opposing forces. So you kind of have to find a happy medium. Um, fencing and water can kind of hinder some of this rotational grazing because obviously you can't put, can't fence off a part of your pasture that doesn't have water and make your cows stay in there. Um, so those are things you kind of have to think about. And again, consider starting small. Like if you have one pasture you want to try some rotational grazing on, just see how it goes. Um, I think it's a really good idea. Um, so now I kind of mentioned stockpiling a couple times in this presentation. Um, stockpiling grass is all about letting it grow to maturity and waiting until it's dormant to graze it. Okay. Um, especially for some of our cool season species, they have that bump of growth in the fall when it gets cold and rainy again. Um, and that can increase the growth in that pasture and actually increase the amount of dead stockpile you're going to have on that pasture. So I know um, the Dakotas, we, we got some pretty good weather in the fall and some decent rainfall. So there's a lot of areas and a lot of producers that were able to increase the recovery of their pastures. Um, and then they actually have extra grass to graze this winter. Um, and those are all grazing days that they're not necessarily having to feed a harvested, harvested forage. So, um, this is a really good picture that I think kind of demonstrates my point. I hope you guys can see it. This is a fence line dividing two pastures in the exact same location with the exact same weather conditions and everything. But you can see how differently they have been managed during the grazing season, during the growing season. One is protecting soil health and providing additional winter feed as a dormant stockpiled grass. And one, it's not going to give us anything until it grows again when we have rain and a spring green up. This is another picture that really demonstrates how stockpiled or grass cover left on the pasture can harvest that moisture. Um, this moisture either blew away or is already melted and evaporated. This moisture is going to hang around because of that grass. So. Again, um, if you kind of think about those growing curves of different grass species, um, the earlier you graze a pasture in the season, the more recovery it's going to have, the more likely that you can graze it as stockpiled grass in the winter. Using a rest rotation strategy is really beneficial for stockpiling grass. The longer you can go to let that grass be ungrazed, the more you're going to have as a supply in the winter. And dry cows, again, they're at their lowest nutrient requirements in their life cycle. They can pretty well meet their requirements on native dormant grass. Those invasive grasses, again, they don't hold on to their nutrient, requ nutrient quality anymore. Um, so you're gonna have to supplement a lot more on those invasive grasses. Um, but again, stockpiling grass, it's dormant grass is not as high quality. So as those cows advance in their gestation, um, you're going to probably have to provide more supplement. And again, um, winter weather conditions exist. So even if they're out grazing stockpiled grass, 
you may have to provide some hay and things like that um, when weather requires it. So some of my take home messages, I covered a lot of strategies very briefly in this, um, but think about ways that you can increase your grazing days. Um, make your cows do the work to go harvest the feed they need, right? If you have the opportunity, even adding a couple weeks of grazing um, or a month of corn residue, something like that, that you're not having to feed hay, that's gonna be um, really impactful on your harvested feed costs. Seeking collaborations on cropland um, between crop producers and livestock production. Um, there's a lot of benefits to this. And again, even small windows of grazing can be really impactful. So if you think about ways that you can collaborate. Um, and again, soil health is really important on both cropland and grassland. Um, soil health impacts our plant health, which impacts our animal health, which impacts our health. Um, so it kind of starts from the ground up. And anything you can do to increase diversity. Again, you can interpret this how you want. Um, Increase your options increases your adaptability. Give yourself options for grazing. Give yourself options for different species. Maybe consider multi-species grazing, multiple plant species, things like that. I'm not saying those are like the how-to, but just think about ways that you can increase diversity on your operation. Um, and with that, this is my contact information. Um, again, I'm a range field specialist, so um, with South Dakota State Extension, um, located in Pierre, kind of centrally located in South Dakota. So I'd be really happy to talk to any of you guys um, and answer any questions that you have. And thank you. Mm -hmm.